The religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend personal God and avoid dogma and theology. Can you feel it? A sort of anticipation growing stronger and stronger? Another way of putting it is time is speeding up. We've heard that discussion for a while now. I know many people are feeling it, whether it happens while observing world events or perhaps through personal experiences in their own lives. Something big is happening. You can see signs of it all over the world. Technology is rapidly transforming the way that we live our lives. Information of literally every variety is available to us at the touch of a button. We are seeing huge debates and conversations taking place about all manner of subjects, from equality to major global issues. New cryptocurrencies appear to be on the brink of changing the way that we interface with finances and wealth. And while all the while we keep seeing warnings from scientists about global warming and overpopulation, which if things reach some sort of dangerous climax, it has the potential to catapult us into a different way of life very quickly. And with all of these changes, we are actively in the process of discovering something amazing. We are remembering who we are. This revolutionary discovery is what will transform life on earth into something completely different, something incredible and beautiful, aligned harmoniously with nature. So many people across the globe are learning about this and by applying what they've learned to their lives have come to witness marvelous changes. Some have been so impacted that they've dedicated their lives to sharing what they've learned with the world. Personally, I'm someone who's still exploring it and I want more people to talk about it with. Mind, body, spirit. This is the sacred trinity behind life on earth. Without even one of these three, we could not function properly. And yet in today's world, we really only understand two of the three. We have scientifically mapped the brain and have a fairly comprehensive understanding of the body. We understand so much about each of these, yet what do we really know about the spirit, the soul? What is it? Where does it come from? For centuries, religions have been the primary source for answers pertaining to the soul, but they're not concrete. Each religion has its own answers about how things work on the spiritual level. Yet, as we've touched on, with so much information available to us and many ancient discoveries continuing to redefine our history, there are many people now recognizing the common threads between all of these religions and putting the pieces together along with modern science, which is skyrocketing our understanding further and further into an amazing new world of freedom and delight. For a long time, these incredible insights went largely unnoticed by the global community. And while governments and secret services of the world acknowledge them, it wasn't something that really got to the masses. Yet today, the world is waking up. Today, this information is freely available to all of us and I'm gonna share it with you. Have you ever had a moment where you knew exactly what someone was going to say two or three seconds before they even started talking? Do you have a shared connection between a loved one or a pet where you can always tell exactly what the other was feeling or what they're thinking of even when they're not really around? What about that curious feeling like you were being watched only to turn around to see, yak? Yeah, just like that. We've all had experiences like these at least a few times, some many more than others. There are even a few people who can tap into this experience quite easily. And while generally they're written off as being crazy, maybe we've been mistaken. Perhaps there's genuine validity to the idea of psychic. In the world of science, what do we really know about consciousness? We don't really know what consciousness is or how it works. This is what is sometimes called the hard problem because there's no obvious explanation for why we should be conscious at all. And it's because of this reason that consciousness studies is one of the most exciting frontier areas of science today. For a long time, scientists believed that thoughts resided purely in the brain and that was the end of the story. Today, however, we understand a lot more and there are several individuals and their teams I'd love to give special commendations towards. The first scientist is a man named Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, PhD. This man has compiled a number of powerful and thought-provoking experiments which change the way that we look at and understand our minds. From his work and experiments, he puts forth the idea that the mind is not isolated inside the head at all, but extends out into the world around us as a morphogenetic field. One thing I love about this man is that he used very practical and common experiences that many of us go through on a daily basis and turned them into a wide array of powerful scientific experiments. In one particular experiment, 
They demonstrated the connection between dogs and humans by monitoring the behavior of the dog when the person was out of the house. And the dogs would repeatedly show behavior of waiting by the door for their human buddy as early as when the person even had the intention to go home, even from long distances away. Skeptics are often quick to respond that the dogs are used to hearing familiar car sounds or they know generally what time their human comes home at. And so Dr. Sheldrick ran the experiments using unfamiliar cars and random and unusual times for the individuals to go home, which still yielded the same results, having the dogs wait by the door the moment that the person sets the intention to return. Dr. Sheldrick also did a number of experiments which he described as telephone telepathy, in which people would randomly call a participant and the person on the receiving end would have to guess who is calling them out of a list of possible callers. The results of this study showed a rather high level of intuition for most people who were able to guess who was calling at a rather high rate than you would expect if it was purely random guessing. This experiment was also taken further with the sense of being stared at, where he proved that people were able to intuitively know whether or not they were being watched with stunning results as well. Using this morphogenetic field theory, we are able to explain how herd animals move together as if they were a single unit. Dr. Sheldrake explains this by suggesting that each animal in the herd acts a bit like they were their own magnet, emitting its own unique signal into the field. But as they all come together, much like magnets, they link together to form a singular larger field. What Dr. Sheldrake concludes through his publications and presentations is that the cosmos is not a lifeless mechanism that we have essentially believed since the 17th century, but an organic living system, which is designed to evolve and grow, just as we experience in our own lives. I think my favorite line of his is that in response to people who suggest this phenomenon is paranormal and whatnot, he simply says, it's not paranormal, it's normal. It's not supernatural, it's natural. In the comments below, you can find links to Dr. Sheldrick's presentation that he gave at Google in 2008, as well as one to an interview he did in 2016. And there are several wonderful Gaia presentations featuring his work as well that we'd love for you to check out. The next scientist I want to share with you is Dr. Dean Radden, PhD, and his team at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. These amazing people have created a most compelling experiment where they demonstrated that using nothing but meditative thought you can affect the outcome of an experiment from the other side of the planet in real time. Dr. Radden's talk begins by him describing that almost all of the fathers of quantum mechanics have described that something extra physical must be involved in the measurement chain of an experiment. And by this, they referred to consciousness, something outside of what we know as material reality. He then goes on to explain that they built a very simple double slit experiment. Most of you are probably familiar with the double slit experiment, but the simple version is that this is an experiment which shoots photons through two slits, making a pattern appear on the receiver past the slit openings. The thing about this experiment that has mystified scientists for years is that if you don't observe the experiment, the photons seem to shoot through both slits and act as a waveform, giving you a unique wave pattern in the results. However, if you actively observe the photons as they're going through the hole, the photons change their function and act more as if they were solid objects and either go through one hole or the other, giving you a pattern on the receiving end simply as two slits, as you might expect if you were shooting a tiny BB gun through the holes. Now, what Dr. Radden and his team did was take this experiment to the next level by taking meditators outside of the room and away from the double slit machine to focus on the experiment taking place and see if they can, using nothing but their thoughts, intentions, and consciousness, affect the outcome of the experiment. The results of this experiment were so phenomenal and conclusive that they received a five sigma result, which in science terms essentially means that there is only a one in 3.5 million chance that the positive results they received were due to statistical fluctuations over the spectrum of the experiments performed. Because of these tremendous results, the Noetic Sciences team put their experiment on the internet to really put it to the test. And between January 2012 and December of 2014, they received thousands of sessions from around the world. Once again, they received compelling results of an individual's ability to affect the outcome of an experiment irrespective of distance. People did this from across the globe and still affected the experiment's results in real time simply by the power of their meditation. Further, we should mention that these guys were incredibly thorough in their experiments, taking account of a wide array of possibilities that might be affecting the outcome of the experiment. Dr. Radden also presents towards the end of his talk that they are not the only ones who have demonstrated this, 
and he pulls out a number of past experiments that have been done throughout the last several decades that have come to the same conclusions, but of course, didn't receive much respect from the global scientific community. He explains that this is likely because most of science so far is based on a materialistic paradigm, and that if we add consciousness to the base in our model of the universe, as long as we can figure out the bridge between consciousness and physics, we don't have to throw out our old information, but rather just continue to add to it and develop our understanding as we always have done. If you're curious about all of the details, I highly recommend watching the full presentation on YouTube, and we'll include links to this in the comments below. What Dean and his team essentially concluded was that it's not so much that consciousness just collapses the wave function, but rather that consciousness steers the outcome of the experiment. Observational effect is an active experience rather than passive. Further, the role of consciousness in the physical world can be tested. It has been tested many times and in many ways. And the results of these experiments suggest that consciousness is an active participant in reality. Now, these experiments largely have to do with thought, feeling, and intention. But as we discussed earlier, what about the soul? Well, this is very interesting because in a book called The Field by Lynn McTaggart, she shares with us the work of a man named Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, PhD. This man and his researchers have conducted experiments that confirms the existence of biophotons. These particles of light with no mass transmit information within and between cells inside of us. His work shows that DNA in a living cell stores and releases photons creating biophotonic emissions that may hold the keys to illnesses and health. Over the years, Pop has published eight books and more than 150 scientific journal articles and studies which address many questions of theoretical physics, biology, complementary medicine, and biophotons. There's some great articles and videos to check out about his work, and we'll post some links to those in the comments below as well. Dr. Pop's work is especially interesting because it describes that at our most fundamental level, we are beings of light. This goes back to a number of ancient spiritual traditions and teachings who explain that we are all created beings of light, whole and complete, but have forgotten who we are. And that by our process of remembering, we can actively increase the amount of light that our DNA is emitting and raise our consciousness to a point that we may experience what is called ascension the rising into a new way of life and a new world of possibilities opens to us free of suffering. This is what is described by the card, the child in Patch Tarot, which fuses the zero and the one together, showing the connection between the masculine and the feminine within us, the harmony between the heart and the mind in perfect balance to create the phi ratio and speaks to the limitless possibilities that are available to us when we live from this enlightened place. Now, with all of this research out of the way, Let's bring things down to a practical level for all of us. Let's say for the sake of discussion that when you think of something, anything, it appears right in front of you. No, not physically, but let's say it appears in a different realm, one that is in and around all of us, the field that the scientists were describing by their experiments. We can call it the field, the astral realm, the thought realm, whatever you like. For the sake of simplicity, in this video, let's call it the field. When you're doing something, you start by thinking about it. Whether you're building a pool in your backyard or making a sandwich, you have to have thought of it first. Even the subconscious thoughts for things like walking and breathing. This shouldn't be anything new to us. We think of things before we do them. Even if it's a split second before the action, this is just how we function and the physical actions we take generally match the thoughts that we've created in our minds. You might say that we move through our thoughts, turning non-physical thoughts into physical actions. When an inventor gets an idea, this idea can quickly move through all of his colleagues and friends. And this is because ideas and thoughts are spreadable. Multiple people can concentrate upon the same idea at once, allowing the ideas to grow and develop further. This isn't anything strange. Think tanks have existed long into our history. In this scenario, don't think of thoughts as separate, but as a whole that everyone is focusing upon at the same time, and maybe even through time itself. Of course, because we can't physically see this realm of thoughts, we have to use functions like speech and body language in order to communicate them. At least for now, this is how we connect and bridge our thoughts together, through communication. Because of this, we add a bit of our own creation to the mix every time we share something, our own spice, if you will, while still working towards the same common goal. A social gathering is another good example of this at work too. People gather together because they share the same thoughts and emotions as the rest of the people there. Even if you're using something that someone else made, 
which let's face it, basically every aspect of our lives involves using something that someone else or nature itself produced, you're still creating your own experience for yourself. You manifested that iPad, house, relationship, or whatever into your experiences. With the notion that thoughts connect with other thoughts comes our first big realization. This new understanding of just how intertwined we really are. We are not only connected in the physical realm, but mentally and spiritually as well. Up until recently, humankind has always understood that they were connected only through their physical being. We assumed that the conscious experience and all of the thinking was totally 100% isolated from everyone else. The fact is, we're not. We are so connected with each other, it's almost impossible to believe. But it's true. We have the science to back it up. Now, thoughts being created are just the tip of the iceberg. The real interesting part comes when you look at emotions. Emotions are much more powerful than thoughts in that they have more gravity. Emotions pull on you. They often control your actions and guide you throughout your life. It's not always your thoughts that decide where you sit in a classroom or on a bus, but rather if you like that girl or you think that guy smells. When a couple is together, it's their emotions that keep them tethered. If they're fighting, it's their emotions that break them apart. You watch TV or movies that stimulates and compels you on an emotional level. You hang out with friends because you have emotional bonds with them. And now this applies on a smaller scale too. Do you ever have a morning where you wake up grumpy and stub your toe getting up and just think, ah, this is just gonna be one of those days. And then the entire day following is terrible and just everything goes wrong. What about days where you wake up excited and happy and ready to go? Your whole day is just excellent in all of the right ways. Even if something bad does happen, you're less affected by it because you're in such a great place emotionally. The reason for these different potentials in how your day goes is due to your emotional state. And to that end, if you wake up in the morning and just take a deep breath and say a prayer of gratitude for your life and the dawning of a new day, it will instantaneously align you with a more harmonious day for yourself. Even if something bad does happen, you can experience it as an opportunity for learning and growth rather than something that, ah, sucks, poo, now I'm in a bad mood, grr. You see, it's through our conscious participation in our own lives that transforms us from riding on the waves of other people's joys and sorrows to creating our own waves and living the life we want to have. You can look into society and see how we create our lives actively by the way that people speak and act. Those who are the most successful are those who talk most of success and the people who speak most of illness have that. Yes, illness is also a creation of ours. If we have a low immune system, it's because of our own low vibration, which is a product of the disharmony both within us and in our environment. It also relates heavily with food, the primary nourishment that we put in our bodies. Food is a massive conversation on its own and you can learn more about it in our food series, episode 33. We can liken healing with healthy food to healing from mental and emotional struggles. What quality of thoughts are you allowing into your heart and mind? In this way, healing is a simple process of going inside and addressing our own negativity, resolving the traumas, releasing the pent up emotional energy and making room for more light to come through. That said, one of the best and easiest ways that we've found to do this is with shamanic plant medicine. And you can learn more about that in my testimony, The Transformation of Jordan River. There's one thing that becomes apparent with this new understanding. We create our reality. We may not always be 100% in control of what happens to us. However, we are 100% responsible for what we do with the experiences that we've had. And we are especially responsible for our own healing of the bad experiences too. Throughout history, we have always played the blame game. It's his fault I didn't get the promotion. It's her fault I couldn't go to the game. It's everyone else's fault I'm so depressed. Whatever it is, and this might be the hardest part to truly get, it's you. All of it is within you. Your happiness, your sadness, your fears and your fortunes. Every single experience of your life on earth was because of you, for you and within you. Remember, just as you are creating your own individual reality, we are all co-creating our realities together. We are one species and as a species, we are creating the realities that we are experiencing as a collective. One argument I hear a lot is, well, what about the starving kids in Africa? How are they creating their starving reality? I would respond to that by suggesting that it's a part of the bigger picture and that if we can see the bigger picture, 
We can bring love and support to those in need if we have more abundance than them. This applies through all levels. As a family, you create your reality and your actions will change what the family experiences. Likewise for a community and a city and a country. Because of this, and because we are not in tune with ourselves, it may often seem like we do not have complete control over what we experience. Sometimes we are seemingly forced into scenarios that are outside of our control. This happens as a result of our collective disharmony and lack of connections to ourselves and our environments. When we become more in tune with what's in our hearts, we can feel out certain scenarios and decide if that's a path we want to take. Maybe I won't go into that dark alley. Maybe it feels right to not take that job. Beyond that, even if you do have an experience that you feel is outside of your control, now it's your turn to decide what you do next. You can allow the experience to get the best of you and drain your energy, or you can decide to take it for what it is, experience it and keep moving forward, keep growing, keep learning. Every dark cloud has a silver lining. And if you're looking for that silver lining, you'll have a much easier time finding it. Many of us have heard of this thing called the law of attraction, which talks about something similar to this. Across the entire world, people have written in to tell of their amazing stories where they really focused on meeting their heart's desire and then received it through some miracle or synchronicity. This is but a small piece in the vast ocean of the internal world that we're talking about. And it is incredibly real. And you can literally change everything in your life by the power that's inside of you. I know this from my own personal experiences and it's not hard to find others who have too. One continuous argument I hear from people who deny this whole thing is something like, you don't just think things and change everything by sitting on your butt. To which I reply, exactly. You never stop moving. Change your mindset and continue on with your life. Cultivate your emotions, focus your thoughts and move into them physically. Don't let your emotions control you. Pull your thoughts into the physical realm. What can you do to change things? Honestly, just start by being good to yourself. Fill yourself up with the emotion of gratitude for even the smallest things and let it fill you to overflowing. Don't forget to treat yourself once in a while and try to change your perception of your life from what others think is best for you to what you think is best for you. Take a few minutes to sit down and really ask yourself, what do you really want? Of course, at first, a lot of people might think of money, wealth, fame, and luxury. And hey, I'm sure those things can be pretty nice, but will they buy you happiness? I guess that depends on you and what you do with it. I found in my experiences that beyond all of those things, what people really want is to be accepted, appreciated, and loved. By genuinely giving to others, you will in turn receive that back and the bonds that connect you to everything around you will strengthen so much further. I want to bring up one more thing before we end this video. There was a scientist in Japan a few years back who made an incredible discovery, but one that even today is generally unacknowledged by the global scientific community. Many of us are familiar with the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto and his experiments freezing water into crystals, which would change their form depending on what emotions were meditated upon before freezing. Now, this experiment received a lot of scrutiny and several failed attempts to reproduce it. However, there is another version of it, which is equally as moving. Emoto discovered that by putting words on the side of a jar of rice with water in it, and every day casting either love, hate, or unacknowledgement towards the jar, it would dramatically change the way that the rice fermented. This experiment has been performed around the world and is easily replicatable by anyone, even you. And I super encourage anyone who's interested to look up the experiment and give it a try. And for those who have trouble replicating the experiment, we might find more information with Dr. Radden's presentation, who says that there was a very clear difference in the results between practiced meditators and people whose minds tend to wander. Having a strong mental and emotional resonance will affect the outcome of the experiment significantly. If thoughts and feelings can do this to organic matter, just imagine what they can do to us. Well, looks like we're about done for the day. But before I go, I want to leave you with words to be with for anyone looking for direction in their lives right now. You can have, do, or be anything you want. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you everyone once again for watching this whole video through. From all of us at Spirit Signs, we hope